Um, good morning, everybody. So hopefully you had a, um, a nice um, dinner yesterday and enjoyed Huth. So like my, my talk this morning will be around um, um, climate resilience and how we can have a strategy, an integrated strategy to increase the climate resilience for communities and cities. And um, the main thing that I wanted to kind of like um, share with you is like as scientists, we know for a fact a two meter sea level rise is actually happening. There is no way around it, it's gonna happen. Now the only uncertainty is when it's gonna happen, right? Is it gonna happen in the next 100 year or 200 years or 50 years? It all depends on how good as a humanity we react, right? Um, now when you combine that sea level rise together with um, extreme climate events, take for example storm surges, then the impact is actually disastrous um, for those coastal communities. And that's the key. It's not only about the sea level rise. It's not only about the overall global climate change. It's about the localized extreme events that will happen together with that, right? So that takes us how we adopt. Now, uh, it was a lot of research um, within the EU, and we got the EU mission adaptation to climate change. And to summarize here, what, we, what we're trying to do is developing a regional systematic transformation, um, so transformative solutions that is actually based on nature-based solutions and smart technologies. And I'll explain why we use nature-based solutions and why we cannot say transformative um, um, solutions and why we kind of like need to integrate smart technologies. Now, the concept of the nature-based solutions as, um, as solutions for um, a climate adaptation like really raise um, into, um, you know, into the scene as a proposed solution for climate change in 2009 in, in COP15 in Copenhagen. That was the first time the nature-based solution have been proposed as the mainstream solution to actually um, act on climate um, uh, for, for, for local communities. Then after that, the development around it and use it as a strategy for adaptation and start like moving um, across the years. And we've seen a lot of developments. So like, you know, you can see like in 2015, um, you know, EU tried, you know, to invest a lot of money within the research around the use of nature-based solutions as adaptation solutions for climate change. And we've got Think Nature in 2017 established, and we got Obla, which kind of like the, 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 the platforms that, the knowledge around nature-based solutions to be used as um, climate resilience solutions has been um, documented. Then, so what is nature-based solutions? Now the definition of nature-based solution has been evolved, right? We have so many definitions and all the time we, you know, the researchers have tried like to widen their understanding of nature-based solutions. So nature-based solutions, there are any solutions that are inspired by the nature, right? So they do not need to be natures by themselves, they're inspired by the nature. But the most important thing is, in addition to addressing um, you know, the issue and causing no harm, they need to satisfy three main reactors. So we talk about um, solutions for society, economy, and environment. So any solution inspired by the environment causing no harm and providing three, you know, three benefits in terms of society, economy, and environment can be regarded as a nature-based solution and can be used as a strategy to act on a climate change. Now, the thing is, um, after, you know, after those of, you know, since 2009, um, and after COP, you know, you know, 15, the countries started like to implement nature-based solutions as strategies um, um, to act on climate change in the different communities. And you can see there's a lot of uptake and implementation for the nature-based solutions um, to act on climate change across the world. Um, which is good, but we, so 2020, um, there's always a but, right? Um, um, we've got this important report from United Nations Environment Program, and simply what it says, yes, they're great, but we don't know how great they are, right? Uh, we don't know how effective they are. Um, we're not sure do they work or not. So the whole debate within the scientific community about how we can assess the nature-based solutions to be solutions for climate change has started. And then, um, and, 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 and what, you know, a, a whole research program within the EU um, has been established. We can tell a huge amount of money has been established within um, the EU context to actually research 
um, um, the, what parameters do we need to monitor around nature-based solutions to prove that they're effective, how we can optimize them, how it's going to be like an ongoing optimization process to make sure that those nature-based solutions, long-term wise, they're actually effective on acting on climate change, right? So um, you've got a lot of initiatives, and each of them is very unique in terms of developing technologies and, and, and parameters and methods to actually assess how effective nature-based solutions towards um, acting on climate change. Now, a lot of projects, you have you know, um, um, main things you've got here, like in 2016, Obla and Think Nature, the two platforms that collect all the information and all the knowledge around the nature-based solutions. They've got established there, and everything is actually documented. Then they've got a lot of different projects, include Oprandum, um, Connecting Nature, um, 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 and, and different projects that actually progress the knowledge within this domain. So we've got a number of, when we look at assessing um, the nature-based solutions, one of the many projects that you know, we worked on here um, in, in UCD was called the Prandum, and this project has actually established the parameters that we need to look at in order to assess um, nature-based solutions um, and be able to optimize it as a solution for, um, for climate change. And you can, like, to summarize, we have two sides of, of the parameters. You've got environmental, pro, um, environmental parameters and you've got um, socioeconomic and well-being. Uh, parameters and then each of those obviously have a specific methodologies and accepted methodologies so we can compare the effectiveness of the nature-based solutions across across the world right um, now okay we've got to say okay nature-based solutions but there is a there is a new concept now when we say um, nature-based solutions it have to be you know we need to get like those three benefits we need to cause no harm it's not really, um, you know, nature anymore. So we start looking at what we say hybrid nature-based solutions. And the concept about hybrid nature-based solutions is basically the more you engineer the nature-based solution, the more ecosystem services you get out of them. It's kind of like a, a relationship. Like the more engineering you put, hopefully you get more. Otherwise, you know, the engineering efforts are just like a waste of money, right? Um, so what we <clears throat> so we got that concept of ecosystem-based adaptations. So we kind of like widen our understanding a little bit. Instead of using nature-based solutions, we now like say it's ecosystem-based adaptations. So we engineer the nature-based solutions to make sure that we'll be able to optimize the nature-based solution across the years so they can be sustainable solutions for a climate crisis. Um, so they need to be implemented um, in a systematic way. Um, and we need to integrate them in smart technologies. Why? Simply because we need tools to measure how effective they are how effective, and those tools need to be on, on, on you know, real-time measurement. We cannot afford just implementing you know, a, a campaign that we measure like every, every 10 years or every five years, because the knowledge is actually development. We need data all the time. Um, so we need kind of like real-time data, and then when we have real-time data, we'll be able to connect the real-time data source to um, integrated models. Those models will be shadowing um, the, um, the, the actual environment. So what you actually develop is what we call a digital twin solution or a digital shadow, right? Now, there are two, you know, there are two different things, but let's agree for now, like they're you know, like shadowing what's going on. So we allow us to, two important things, monitor the effective of, of the solutions being implemented. And the other thing is um, being able to test different what if scenarios. So you'll be able to optimize the nature-based solution across the years, and you'll be able to calculate how effective they are, right? Um, so when we say we need to implement it in a systematic way, why? Well, simply because climate change is not a simple problem. You cannot assume that you know, the traditional way of having a problem and a solution, linearity between them is actually going to work. Simply within a community, we have different systems, and those systems are very complicated and by itself, and they, they interact between each other. So when you, need, when you design a nature-based solution, or, or when you design a solution for climate change, you need to step back and look at the full picture. And then what, is, what that takes is actually mapping all the different systems and look out how, how they actually interact between each other and how they impact each other. So whenever you actually optimize a solution, that solution can actually work for all the different components of the community. So it's not simple, and you cannot look at linearity. It's all about all the systems interacting between each other. So how we do it, 
right? We've agreed, like, it's complicated, it needs to be systematic. How we do it? Well, there are different techniques, but what we, you know, what the researchers now are kind of like um, agreed on is what we call the use of living lab as a systematic way to um, design, co-design and co-create um, solutions and to act on climate change. And simply what living labs are, um, they're virtual platforms um, that allow all the stakeholders to be mapped and work together to co-define, co-design, co-create the nature-based solution in a systematic, iterative way. And that's important. What we mean by the iterative way is every single step is actually collecting feedback and then feed it to the previous one. And then the whole process is actually working all the time. So you keep optimizing the nature-based solution or, or the solution um, as you go all the time. And that means you still need the real-time data, right, all the time to be fed into the system. So like, without getting into the details of the living labs, it's kind of like you have a problem space, a solution space, and, and the deployment space. Each of those would have some number of steps. Those steps, they're running in iterative, like I should have, you know, I've, I've done this a, a, long, a long time ago, but we should have like made it like maybe um, some sort of a, a, a cycle. Each of those steps, they actually feed into each other, and that's how it works. Now, it's not perfect. There is a lot of research gaps in it, and we, for the last 10 years, the research community is actually working on trying to perfect this. I'll tell you where the gaps like by, probably by the end of the um, presentation, but it's actually working, as we can see, and um, that any solution that is designed using this way, we have some sort of models that prove that it, it actually work better than any other way of designing those, those solutions. So we mentioned we need those smart technologies to be integrated. So like if you think about a nature-based, well, if you think about um, how we can act on climate change, you actually now look at three pillars, really. You, um, you have um, you know, um, ecosystem-based adaptations as a concept of thinking to develop the solution. You, act, you have the systematic way, which is the living lab, and then you need to have the technology to support the real-time data need, right? Um, so in the Internet of Things and, and, and the smart city is, is a huge part of this. Um, and the concept of using low-cost sensitive technologies, like when we talk about the technologies, we have high-end sensitive technologies, which is need, obviously very expensive, and most importantly, need a lot of expertise, need very special, specialized, trained people, which is, you know, we have a few of them, like believe it or not, we have very few of those people across the world. But, our data needs are much more what, you know, what we can provide from those expertise. So like we need to start investing in what we call the low cost sensitive technologies, which practically cost much, much less, and do, they don't need um, the expert, you know, experts to run. So we can use them together with what we call citizen science. So you can turn every single garden, every single house, every single um, have, um, you know, citizen, um, to a data collection point. Um, and now the technology allow us to perform what we call self-calibration self and self-validation using um, data, data management platforms. So the, actually the data processing um, is helping us now to move uh, more. We still need the high end sensing technologies, but the majority of the data would be coming from the low end sensing technologies. And what, that's why we need those local sensors to be implemented simply because you can deploy a large number of them, so you get to cover a lot um, in terms of a spatial scale. The real, um, you get real time. You can connect it to um, a data management platform, and then the data management platform can be connected to um, to your um, digital shadow or digital model, the integrated model, and then you will have a real time representation of what's going on, right? And that's that's the key to test different what-if scenarios and to optimize solutions for the city or for the, for the community. Now, how they do look like, now there's a lot and we can spend a lot of time like talking about, the, you know, um, about those local sensors, but I'll give you one example that we actually used in Sligo and Dublin because we're in Ireland, um, which is the smart pebbles. You remember those pebbles that you've seen yesterday on, on the beach? So we get those, we drill them, and we equip them with sensors, and we give them to the citizens and citizens spread them, and we'll be able to monitor data, real-time data through scanners that we, we run um, on, on, you know, on a regular basis. So we get real-time data from, 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 the, 
for, for, from the community and from the beach. And that's how we feed that real-time data on our digital twin, as I'll see, I'll show you in a minute. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but that's kind of like the idea. So what is actually allowing you um, to have is you integrate those real-time data together with the integrated environmental model, and then you will have a digital twin or a digital shadow, and that will allow you to have a what-if scenario testing. So if you have um, a policymaker wanted to build a bridge, you'll be able to actually have a representation in the bridge in the, in, in, in the model and then see how they actually um, um, interact with, with the whole community and how it impacted. And you'll be able to calculate um, um, the cost benefit and you'll be able to run multi-criteria analysis and you'll be able to do a whole, a whole um, um, integrate, a whole detailed study about the solution that you're proposing because obviously you have a real-time representation um, that will allow you to hopefully avoid making mistakes. Um, now, when we, when we put all of those things together, we came up with um, the idea of the SCORE project. Maybe like uh, you've heard like from, um, from Pete like on, on the first day about it. So the SCORE project um, is basically working on those all um, um, research gaps that I just mentioned. Um, and it stands for Smart Control of Climate Resilience in European Coastal Cities. The Horizon um, um, 2020 project aims to develop an integrated framework that can be replicated and scaled to act on a climate change to increase the climate resilience in coastal cities. Um, and, you know, we, we actually implemented a network of cities across Europe that can learn from each other. So we tested that integrated framework in all of those 10 cities um, and, um, and, and, and trying to formulate it into a cookbook so ca cities can use it to actually act on a climate change. So the whole thing is based on three main pillars that I just explained. So ecosystem-based adaptations, living labs as a systematic way, and then the use of digital technologies, which include the data management platform, the digital twin, and, and the low-cost sensei technologies, right? Um, now, when we have those integrated into each other in a systematic way, you'll be able to have all that, you know, way of systematically um, 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 design, co-design and co-create a solution um, and be able to optimize it um, across, you know, across the years. So that's the whole idea of, of this project. Now, the cities that, you know, we have, as I said, like 10 cities across Europe and, and Turkey, and in each of those cities, we try to aim to have different climate challenges. So some of the cities would have um, um, coastal erosion, some of them would have coastal flooding, um, some of them would have, um, you know, um, um, heat waves, um, storm surges, and so on. Um, the idea is whatever the climate challenge that facing the community, um, we need a systematic way, like a unified way to actually work on it. So that's, that's you know, it's not the details, it's, it's the whole framework. So we've, you've, you've got to establish your, um, your living lab, you've got to map your stakeholders, you've got to map your system, you've got to, um, you know, to, de to design the data collect collection like methodologies, you, you've got to design your digital shadow, and then after that, you'll, you know, the, whole, the whole system will be um, hopefully understood, and then you'll try to optimize the solution. So we're testing that integrated solution in those 10 cities, um, in Ireland, we have Sligo and Dublin, we have Barcelona, we have Bilbao, we have Alicante, we work with Massa in Italy, um, and um, we have Samson and Cooper in Slovenia, right? So we have a number of cities across Europe and, and Turkey that each of those um, have um, different, um, different kind of challenges. So the whole, the whole project is actually, you know, um, um, kind of um, divided into number of work packages. And simply those work packages are designed under those concepts like I just explained. So work package one is working on mapping the hazards and the history of, of, of those hazards and how, how you can work on the risk. Work package two is working on establishing the living labs and evaluating them and, 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 and share the knowledge out of them. Work package three is working on producing localized, high quality um, climate um, climate projections, work package four is working on the local sense of technologies design and, and implementation and obviously integrating the citizen science. Work package five is a very important piece working on data management platform where all the data will be collected and then classified and then um, that's, you know, the, um, 
the self-calibration for the sensors, and then the data will be ready to be fed for um, the integrated model um, that is being developed in Work Package 8, um, that, you know, an uh, integrated physical model together um, that will produce um, um, a digital twin solution. And then you can run, once you have that all implemented, you can run socioeconomic um, um, evaluation, and you can also do um, strategies uh, financial strategies um, and, and solutions to make sure that the solution is actually sustainable, right? Um, so that's kind of like the whole package all together to, you know, and we're trying to make sure that this is packaged in a way that can be replicated and expandable, right? Um, so what we've done is we've analyzed all of the cities at the start of the project to make sure that we understand how far they actually advanced. So we identify the front runners for some of those activities. Some of the cities, they do have um, um, good experience in, in deploying local sensors. Some of them would have good experience in co-creation principles. So we've actually looked at those and we created a network of cities that can learn from each other. And that network of cities can expand, which we already did, right? So we started with a smaller number and then we expanding. And all the time we see how actually the knowledge can be transferred quite very easily because we've created MOOCs that can actually look at each of those components. Um, now, when we, like I mentioned several times, the integrated models, I'm not gonna get into the details of, 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 of the technical details of those models, but how it actually look like your, your digital shadow is an integrated, um, you know, it's a model running all the time, fed by real time data, um, that has, um, you know, a number of components, a number of models nested into each other. So you have a global climate model in that you have an atmospheric model and then you have model, wave model and hydrological model. Obviously for each of the case studies, you don't need to run all of those components um, because that's a computational cost, yeah, right? Um, so you've got all of those models nested into each other and based on what you're trying to test, you actually keep them running and that is actually um, fed by real-time data. And that will enable you to test different what-if scenarios. And I'll explain a little bit more like once I get to the, um, to the, to the Sligo case study. Now, when you look at what that actually allows us to do is to have a real-time um, early warning support system. Because once you'll be able to predict what's gonna happen, you'll actually be able to predict it to at least two weeks in advance. So, because you have a global climate model and in it nested like um, a regional model and it nested like a hydrological model and so on. Um, so, you'll have real time data feed, you'll have the baseline, you'll have and then the data collected from, uh, from the models and then you'll get the classifier and based on the preset scenarios, you'll be able to actually take a decision um, for early warning. And, one, and then once the data is available, you actually can very quickly perform uh, finance and, and economic analysis for the lost if, if the, if the event occurs, right? So that's kind of like um, the ultimate goal like over the years. Now, we're still working on this. Um, we've got more funding, so like, you know, still a work in progress, but that's kind of like the ultimate goal that you can get. Now, within Dublin, we worked on, um, on the coastal flooding issues. Um, and then like the data collection system is kind of like satellite images integrated with low cost um, um, and environmental sensors spread across the cities and those fed into that model that I just showed you. And um, that kind of, um, we, we implemented the sustainable urban drainage and we're trying to monitor that using that model. And we're working with the Leary County Council mainly uh, within Dublin to actually activate that kind of approach. Um, um, a lot of publications out of that particular case study, if you're interested, um, I can leave them with you. But within the Sligo case study. Now, Sligo is, 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 is very interesting case study, not because I'm from there, but because, um, um, you know, it has um, the component of coastal erosion, heavy coastal erosion, and you have the extreme weather events from the storm surge. So you really need real-time monitoring of the coastal erosion, and you need real-time prediction of the storm surge because both of them, when they get together, they actually create a huge amount of damage. Um, so the real-time data um, and a collection for, this, you know, for the um, um, erosion is actually collected by integrated satellite images together with a drone and LADAR, right? Um, and that actually, that kind of system all the time collecting data and we have a real-time data feed on um, the coastal erosion like from, from the Sligo coast. And that actually help us like kind of predicting. Now, we got that part. The other part is the storm surge. So we've developed like um, for the first time a prediction model for storm surges for the northwest of Ireland, right? And what we've done there is um, 
we've done like two models like to save the computation. One is only on the Donegal Bay and the other one covering the whole Atlantic, simply because climate change is is not simple and you need, in order to have um, a two weeks prediction to be able to issue a warning, you probably need to understand it from the full picture, right? Um, so we, we integrate low cost um, water level sensors with those models and that helps the models being updated with localized data as well so we can get more accurate uh, productions. And you can tell that the two models are performing best now. If, that will take probably a whole hour like to go through it, but just like the idea, if we, ha we have a real-time data source for, climb, um, for coastal erosion and, um, and we have a real-time data feed for the storm surge, and then those can be fed into the digital twin for early warning support system, right? And then what that allows you to do, it allowed us to actually look at the, once you have such a system, you'll be able to do different what-if scenarios, and you have the luxury of looking at different ecosystem-based adaptations, and you'll start implementing, okay, what will happen is if I have this, and what will happen if I have that? So then you'll start making multi-criteria analysis for the different ecosystem-based adaptations, and you start to look at which one is actually working better, and you start looking at mapping all the different systems that we were talking about. Um, so you use like methods like, um, you know, um, causal loop diagrams or co um, uh, fuzzy cognitive mapping when you actually look at all those systems like interacting with each other and then you start testing those solutions. And then you definitely at the end, once you choose your solutions, you'll look at the cost benefit analysis. Now without doing all of that work on providing real time data and having co a systematic way of co-designing, co-create, you wouldn't be able to do to do those kind of analysis at the end to take a very well-informed decisions. So policymakers need those tools and need um, um, and needs those infrastructures to be able to actually take the right decisions. Um, now, just to give you an example, like in one of the cities that um, you know we we finished implementing one of you know um, 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 one of those. Um, um, uh, ecosystem-based adaptation using this systematic way, what we've, sorry, oops. Oh, right. What we've, what we've discovered that is um, a system, um, uh, an ecosystem-based adaptation that got implemented using this systematic way, we were able to actually reduce the economic loss by, um, for all the climatic scenarios, including, um, you know, the historical Right? So you wouldn't be able to actually test all of that without providing all that information. So data is a key. And this is like, from our point of view, is the only way you'll be able to have, afford this kind of data because data can be very expensive. Um, so that's kind of like a sort of a solution being provided. Now we found that useful. So we um, wrote a policy brief um, that was presented for COP27, which I would recommend that you have a look at it if you're interested. And we call it like, it, when two meter sea level rise happened, how we should react and how we should mitigate, right? And simply what we're explaining that is, you know, um, the climate surfaces, how, how they should be, how they should be um, prepared. So we look at um, preparing the ground for adaptation, then the assess the risk, and then we look at the adaptation options, and then the implementation, and then the monitoring. And it's again in a, in a circle wise. So like, that's, um, that's, that's a policy policy brief that is, again, available on, on the website. Now, what also allows, you know, once we have that kind of system available, you'll be able to provide detailed, localized um, um, policy recommendations. And, you know, um, you know uh, two years ago, Sligo County Council was working on developing their own um, climate action plan, and we wrote a, policy rec a localized policy recommendation for them that was detailed on, on what type of actions can be taken. Without that kind of analysis, we wouldn't be able to provide um, a number of solid recommendations. Now, they did assess how much they can afford and took what, what they can and postponed some of them. But again, this kind of approach will enable you to go down to the localized recommendations. Um, that, and that's kind of like an example. Again, it's published on, on, on the website. So like, to make sure that all those you know, papers and documentation that I was showing on the slides, you can have access to them. You can, You'll find us like on, on the website or on the Facebook. They're also available over there. Now, remember, like I said, um, you know, the, the systematic way of using Living Lab is not actually perfect. There's a lot of gaps within it. And one of the main gaps is the transition, how you can actually convince 
the communities to work with you now, apart from mapping them. So there is a whole piece about the transition needs to be included within the living lab, which we kind of like designed the whole, a new project called Empower Us that works um, like for, for a score, you know, um, 28 partners, um, you know, 27, um, you know, physical science and, you know, and, and, and there is and only one social scientist. Empower Us, it's actually, I'm the only one who works on modeling and, 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 and models and data, and the rest are our social scientists, right? Um, because the need is actually around like designing the, the empowerment mechanism like for, for a transition, right? So we can equip the living lab with that kind of transitions. Like, so we, we look, we're looking at this, and again, like we're having a number of case studies, they're all using the living lab, the same technique, continuation of what we've done um, and what we're doing within the score. Now, we also found that there is, a, there is also a gap within, you know, integrating behavioral change um, uh, methods within that systematic way. And, um, and again, we've designed this project that just started, it's called Pro Climate, and it's looking at um, that part of behavioral change integration within the living lab methodology. Um, and again, um, a number of living labs, the same kind of concept to progress the living lab methodology to act in climate change. So that's really all what I wanted to share. So to conclude, really like um, a solution that need to be implemented for climate change need to be around, you know, systematic way using the living lab. We need to work on the transition. We need to work on the behavioral change, integration within the living lab methodology. We need to use those low cost sensitive technologies. And it's important to have real, real time data management system. And, um, and make sure that we have what we call the digital twin, and that digital twin will enable testing different what-if scenarios. I hope you found that useful, and looking forward to your questions. Thanks, you.